Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 323, Thoughts on Changing the Healthcare System. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. As Congress and the nation turn to a consideration of what to do about Obamacare as a result of this recent election, Kathy and I decided uh, that we would like to talk about some things that we have experienced as providers and practitioners. And we have a number of acquaintances who are also providers and practitioners that we'd like to talk a little bit to the American public about what they may not know about how the system works for those who work within it, not just for the patients. We certainly have a concern about that and we'll talk about that some too, but how does it work for doctors? How does it work for psychologists, for counselors, for providers in terms of the way the insurance companies work, in terms of the way the regulatory agencies uh, work, in terms of the way the drug companies work, and how the system works for those who at some point early in their life or their career make the decision, I wanna go into healthcare, A, because I wanna help people, B, because I'm a scientist or want to be a scientist, I want to find a cure for this impossible thing. C, because I want a really good quality of life and I know doctors make a lot of money. (laughs) Uh, So whatever the initial motivating balance is, when they start to look at going to school to get the training, Mm -hmm. then it starts to shake out. There are lots of different options that you can choose. You have to ask yourself, what's my goal? You know, Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, when I come out the other end of the funnel, what do I want to do? Who do I want to be? Do I want to be a specialist? Do I want to be a neurologist, mm-hmm. a cardiologist, a nurse practitioner, a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist? Uh, and, and what are the requirements? What's the cost? What's the time investment, the money investment? How do I, when I graduate, earn a living? Do I start my own practice, open a little office in a storefront somewhere? Mm-hmm. Do I go to work at a hospital? Do I work for a physician? You know, mm-hmm. What do I do? And you and I have had these conversations in part because I'm learning mm-hmm. things I didn't know about the way doctors experience the practice of medicine, mm-hmm. training, qualification, practice, cost, managing an office, working for a hospital. I mean, there are a lot of decision matrices that you have to go through. I'm interested in talking about this because more than what a doctors go through, so because there's not very much sympathy for physicians <laughs> as it stands. That's because people don't know. Because people don't understand what it takes to, to do this right. and, and basically how you have to plan your life and live your life, which is different than most other people. But I also think that if we don't understand what it takes to be a physician and to get there, then mm-hmm. we can't, I mean, we can't understand why the healthcare system is is falling apart. Mm-hmm. We can't understand who's running the show. Mm-hmm. We need to know that because at, in the end, it's all about the patients. Because if be. you don't have proper training or accessible training or affordable training for doctors, you're not going to get the best doctors. You're going to get somebody who got a C and not an A. I mean, if you just say doctors have to do whatever the insurance company says... That's meaning they're practicing medicine. You've got to do whatever they say. That's not medicine. Most of us wouldn't choose ever to be there. And that changes how patients are treated. If you don't pay enough for a procedure, for doctors to actually pay their overhead on it and pay themselves, you won't get that procedure. That's a, that's, there is a consideration by anyone if they say, it's going to cost me money to do that work. Am I going to do that work? Yeah. So that's all of these things come into play and the people holding the holding the strings are the government and are the insurance companies. But to understand what the problem is on the on the physician side, which means what the problem will be on the patient side in the future, you have to understand what it takes to be a doctor and why doctors um, are burning out and they're upset. It, it isn't what they thought it would be. Mm-hmm. So this this is one of those things that I can talk from a past experience, but now I'm out of the system. What I do is independent of insurance companies, independent of the government, and independent of 
everything. Well, you're partially out of the system because you're still regulated by the government. There I are am. things you cannot do by law. Mm -hmm. There are things that you must do by law. I have the to be HIPAA licensed. Rules. You have to have your license. You have to maintain mm -hmm. your license. The government controls all of mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And it says whether or not you can do a procedure like draw blood mm -hmm. in your office, right. which you need to have blood tests. You need to mm -hmm. have the results. But the regulatory system says you can't do this in your office unless, unless you have a license. And or then they have A, B, C, D, E, F. Right. You know? And I'm not sure anybody ever even reads that unless they want to have a license, in that, a CLIA license. So. But, but that's an example. Mm -hmm. And so there are, even though you think you're outside the system, the system still hovers over you oh, and yeah. limits your choices. It does. It and does. the DEA, the FDA, every, I mean, really, there's so many different agencies that regulate us, but I've gotten and they rid don't talk of to each other. some of them. <laughs> yes, yes, you have. And it felt like freedom when I did. Yes. So is there an average? I, mean, I know there's a million different kinds of doctors. Is there an average educational requirement for a physician to practice medicine? It's not an average. It's kind of um, a minimum. You okay. can't practice medicine without going to four years of medical school. First, you have to start with four years of regular well, school. Four years of college. Okay, four years of college. With, ex with excellent grades, graduating right. in the top 1% of your class. And then you have to also take science courses. You have right. to take specific courses to get those A's in, not gym or whatever, but you have to, to so that you can get excellent I'm, I'm grades. laughing because real science versus social science. Right. But I took a lot of social science too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I used to get harassed by people because I wasn't a real scientist. I was a social scientist. Well, I don't harass the you distinction, that. The distinction is you can't replicate the experiment that a social scientist does. And you can replicate chemistry. If yeah. you put these two chemicals together, you're going to get the same thing. If you put them in every the same, time, every time. Mm -hmm. And if you put two marriages together, you're not going to get the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. It's not quite chemistry, but we call it chemistry. We do. We do. <laughs> so, um, in so any you got to take real sciences. So you take real point. sciences. You have to have requirements to go to med school. So that's four years of college, four years of medical school. And medical school is expensive. It's averaging about $49,000 a year just for tuition. And then living expenses, right. $20,000 a year, whatever, to, yeah. to live for you and your family, if you're right. the breadwinner, to live on while you're in that training. And then after that, when you graduate med school, you do have an MD or a DO. Those are both equivalent degrees. And then you choose a specialty. Now, you can't practice without at least a year of general medicine in a residency program, which teaches you really how to interact with patients and how to work with patients one-on-one -on -one and have somebody watching you, teaching you all the time. That's the very minimum. I don't know anybody with just one year. Mm -hmm. So the next step is three-year residencies are usually non-surgical residencies. And those pediatrics, family medicine, um, internal medicine, so if you see an internal medicine doctor or family medicine doctor, usually they're, they have three extra years after medical school. Gynecologists are surgeons, so we have four. Okay. So, and then it goes up from there. You, get, you have to have nine extra years to be a neurosurgeon. After the four and four. So you can't start your career as an independent neurosurgeon. Until you're 40. Until you're 40. <laughs> so you're in training up until then. And then what's your effective work life from 40 on at that level of intensity? 25 years. 25 years? Yeah. So. I mean, 65, 70, yeah. 25 or 30 years. Wow. So, I mean, so the bottom line is that you spend most of your life in school or in training at a, at a cost to you. We were talking about this. As a cost to the doctor, it's, it's hard to get in. That means that only the brightest and the best get well, in, and that means they could go anywhere. They could do anything for any amount of money. That's the type of person that, that gets into medical school. They have a good work ethic or they wouldn't get there. Right. And they, they, have, they have discipline and intelligence right. and, um, and, that, and problem solving skills. So to get there, you have to have all this. Well, you could use that in business and make money quickly. You could do that in many fields and be at the top of your field by the time doctors get out of their training. And that would be true if the only consideration was income. 
There are other I know, considerations I that cause that. people to go to medical school, the desire to contribute, the desire to help, the desire to save lives. Well, or, that's why I went to medical school, but I think so. But and the that, hard reality is well, you we have, have to, to balance <laughs> both realities. You have to realize how long it takes, how long you defer your gratification of earning a, a living and how much you're in the hole. OK, by the so, time I was 30, I was in the hole for thousands and thousands of dollars. So how then? Do we fit that information into our conversation about changing the healthcare system? Well, because you have some thoughts about mm -hmm. that, and based on your experience, your daughter's experience, your mm -hmm. friends' experiences, when you factor in the income they can make versus the cost they mm -hmm. have to pay and the difficulty of going through the hoops to get qualified, mm -hmm. those are all contributing uh, streams. Mm -hmm. Well, but we also talk about things like. Uh, complications of the system, you know. Oh, this how, is just one part of it. That's just one part of it. So let's talk about insurance companies. Let's talk about drug companies. Uh, we we talked some about mm -hmm. federal regulations. Talk about the decision that, that a graduating doctor has to make: Do I start a practice? Do I buy an existing practice and go into more debt, or do I go to work for a hospital and just be an employee? Because mm -hmm. I don't think very many people go to med school with the idea that they're going to become employees. In, now, in they a classical, now they may. Now they may. Now they may. But I don't, I don't think that that's the common thought. The common thought is most doctors want to be independent, mm -hmm. want to make independent decisions. They're intelligent. They don't want to have somebody telling them what to treat a patient with or how to treat them. I mean, we have guidelines, but we have a lot of room and choice mm -hmm. in how to treat a particular patient because no one else is in that room with me. So that, and, that, and looking goes at that to patient. our discussion in previous podcasts about... Uh, off-label decisions right. in, in terms of drugs. Mm -hmm. The the gynecological organization says this drug is what you use for this thing. And, and the then, FDA approves it. And the FDA says amen. So then as a physician who sees a circumstance and you think, well, you know what? I think this drug would help with that. Or you don't have an answer. In many times, like we used to have, um, we used to have a drug we use for seizures. Mm -hmm. And we found that in people with seizures who had migraine headaches, they no longer had migraine headaches. So we started using that drug for migraine headaches long before the FDA approved it. Right. Because it does work. And there are no side effects or few. But you learned that from your own experience and training. And, and you were able to make the decision. And most of the things that I do have to do with physiology. I go back to what the human physiology is. What would work to answer this question when we don't have a drug that answers this question? So in la labor, so if you go back to 40 years ago, preterm labor was, de was, give was dealt with by giving IV alcohol to women. That's how they stopped contractions. So IV alcohol has never been approved by the FDA to stop labor. Was, but, was scotch work just? But what? yes, anything, you know, but it was actually sterile alcohol and it wasn't oral. It wasn't, yeah, but IV, it was still right. gave, made them drunk and made the babies depressed when they were born. So, but having said that, you hope to stop the labor. Well, that's not approved medication, okay? So then they said, well, what else works for this? And they went back to the drawing board and they looked at asthma drugs. Asthma drugs actually work, terbutaline works to stop labor. So they started using that. Well, that, that's never been FDA approved for labor. But we were all trained with it. We've always used tribulin. Mm -hmm. Use it as a shot. Use it as an IV. It stops labor. Mm -hmm. So where would we be without that? We'd be at alcohol, mm -hmm. which was also not FDA approved. Right. So then uh, we start. They started trying to approve approve a different asthma drug for labor, but it was so expensive that none of the hospitals would buy it. Right. So and we that was used, a decision made by the insurance companies. Well, or the hospital. The, the expense cost. No, I mean the expense cost of the drug. At that time, insurance companies weren't in charge. The hospital was. Now the insurance companies are in charge. That was not a. That was long enough ago, that the insurance companies didn't say we're not paying for that. The hospital said, eh, I can get this other one cheaper. We're doing that. Okay. So that was a hospital decision. Now it would be the insurance companies. But so every gynecologist that gives the, says, well, you use terbutaline, it's not, or you use testosterone, it's not FDA approved for women. I'm like, eh, so you use terbutaline, you used, if you're old enough, alcohol, you used all these other drugs. Right. When there's no answer, we use something else. But hospitals now right. won't let us do that unless it's grandfathered in like terbutaline. 
So in the current system as it's structured today, doctors seem to be in a quandary in terms of how am I going to pay all my costs for my education and training, for the operation of my office, for my staff, for my nurses, for the medicines, for the equipment, for the machinery that I have in my office, all of those costs, and see patients and help them get better. Is, is it, I mean, it's an accounting, a bean counting question of Well, you balance. start out altruistically, and you don't think about all this stuff. But right. then when you get into practice, you go... I mean, when you add all up all the costs for overhead and then you add your malpractice insurance and you add all these the staff that you have to have um, just to do basic GYN or basic, wow. basic medicine, then you then look at what's left over after you've seen these patients and gotten paid by what the insurance companies will pay you. So, so let's explain they that pay for you a per visit. Okay. The, the insurance company decides uh, what they will pay for a particular procedure or, or an, office visit. an office visit. And then they contact you and say, if you would like to be on our panel so that we will pay the patients that have our insurance, mm -hmm. we'll pay you. Because if you're not on their panel, they won't pay you. Right. So if you'd like to be on our panel. You have to sign a contract with you them. You sign a contract with them. And the contract will require you to see what, whatever patients they send you mm -hmm. and to re accept whatever they agree to pay. So right. if you say, well, you know, I'd like to charge $100 for an office visit. Mm -hmm. And the insurance company says, well, that's your charge. That's reasonable. That's okay. We'll send you 1,000 patients a year, and you agree to see those particular patients for $75. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, okay, that puts 1,000 in the pipeline. I can make some money but off you, that and pay my costs because i got to pay these costs. But too. volume doesn't matter if you're full. If you are seeing all the patients you want to see, right, then then you get no benefit from an insurance company who's going to send you more patients. Okay, if they're going to pay you less. But if you don't accept their insurance, then what happens? If you don't, then you lose all the patients that you have that have their insurance, right? Unless they want so, to pay, so then you won't be out full. of network. Right. Then you won't be full. So <laughs> it's a take it or leave it deal, and every year. The, pro the money goes down. So what the patients see right. is you think that doctors don't want to sit down and talk to you anymore. Well, that's because when you're paid now 50 bucks for an office visit, you don't get more than five to 10 minutes mm -hmm. because that's what, that's the amount of time 50 bucks. I mean, that's not even 50 bucks isn't even worth that in overhead, but you get a small amount of time because the doctors have figured out they can't pay their bills. Right. If they, so they see have to do 30 volume. patients a day, right. they have to see 60. So then they double book and you get very little time and, and things are, and you only get one problem at a time, one problem, because that's all he can think about or she can think about when she's flying from room to room. So if, I come in and I see you about chest pains, but I also have knee pains and ankle pains. So mm -hmm. today you're going to treat chest pains, make an appointment to see me in a month for your knee pain. Right, because the insurance isn't going to pay me anymore. To see both issues. And it's going to take a lot more time. Right. And then, okay, and then on top of that, if I say, well, I think that you need to have an ultrasound. Right. Okay, so the doctor thinks you need an ultrasound. So then I have to ask the insurance company if they'll pay for it. So I have to have a staff member. I used to have like six staff members on the phone all day because the insurance companies don't have that many people. They, they make you call for a pre-certification. My staff is sitting there doing nothing for 20 minutes so, on hold. So I call an insurance company for pre-certification. You don't. We do. Well, no, no. But I mean, as a provider, mm -hmm. I, I, I or my mm -hmm. staff call the insurance company and say, okay, we've got this suicidal teenager. We need to see him. And, and we need to get it pre-certified so that his insurance will cover mm -hmm. it, else he can't afford the treatment. And so then the other end of the phone call, I've got somebody with a high school education mm -hmm. who's looking at a computer. Who's not medical. Who's not medically who's clerical. Trained. They're looking at a computer that tells them, okay, we'll pay this much for a suicidal teenager for three months. Mm -hmm. And they give me approval for six sessions within a window of time. Mm -hmm. And if I see them for more sessions than that, they won't pay me. Mm -hmm. If I see them for less, that's okay. Mm -hmm. If I see them outside the time window, mm -hmm. they won't pay me. If one right. day after, uh, you may still be suicidal. But at least they can see you. They well. Well, I'm talking if they about like. At all. I'm talking about. I find a mass and I want a patient to have an MRI. Right. I have to. Sp I have to pay somebody 
an hour of time to sit on hold and go through a whole bunch of processes so that the insurance company will say, okay, and we'll pay you, or we'll pay the, the well, radiology but my, department But my point in that 50%. story was I'm talking to somebody who at the insurance have, company who mm -hmm. doesn't have a medical degree, mm -hmm. a licensed responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because insurance companies used to tell me all the time, uh, and lawyers, <laughs> mm -hmm. you are the one that is responsible for the care and treatment, not us. We just decide whether we'll pay for it or not. But see, so if your that's patient's in medicine. crisis, you still have to see them. But then that you see them for free. And you see them for free. But see, right. you see, but that's and, the law, and that's okay. But then you're seeing everybody <laughs> for okay. free. Right. Then you can't make your payroll. Then you right. can't make your overhead, and so you quit. But, but I mean, basically, people retire or quit because they can't pay their bills when the system squeezes them too far. Right. And that is just one facet of the diamond. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's a ton of stuff. Part of what we're talking about is when we talk about either bureaucratic agencies making regulatory decisions, mm -hmm. or we're talking about insurance companies making uh, medical care decisions, or we're talking about drug companies making medical care decisions. Uh, who who's driving the bus? So who's the government making, does the initial decision on what it's going to pay for certain things. Okay. Right. So there's a thing called the federal register and every five years, the federal register comes out with what Medicare will pay for what procedure. Okay. And it's tiny font. I mean, I have to wear my You've reading glasses. glasses. Yeah. yeah. Re reading glasses. I don't usually have to wear, wear to see them. It's so tiny. So I looked through that and I found out that Urologists, mostly treating for male procedures, were paid twice as much as gynecologists for female procedures of an equivalent time, skill, um, uh, med medical malpractice, and time time in the hospital. So for urinary tract infection. No, we're talking surgeries. Okay, surgeries. So procedures. So right. like oh, okay. a, pros a medical so distinction. A radical, a yeah. radical prostatectomy and a radical hysterectomy. Okay. The hist radical hysterectomy was chart or was to be paid half of the radical prostatectomy. Okay. Okay. So I went through all that. I documented all of it, and I called that the current head of the accounting department because it's all accounting, um, in D.C. He was an Iowa, he was an Iowa um, um, senator, and I called his office. Tom and, Harkin. Yep, I talked to him. Thank you. And I talked to his, sec I didn't talk to him, I talked to his secretary. I sent her all my data, and I said, there's something really wrong with this. It needs to be changed. So, <laughs> I'll never do this again. So he actually took it, they voted on it, and they decreased what they paid urologists by half. That's the way they fixed it. <laughs> we'll make everybody poor. So it was so, it, it, it was even. It was is sexually even or gendered so even. So when we when we talk about this, and, and part of the reason this conversation seems so scattered, we're talking about a system as if it is an individual unique system. It's like the six blind guys trying to describe the yeah. elephant. Mm -hmm. You know, which piece are you looking at? How are you looking at it? What senses are you using to obtain your data? And then how does that correlate with everybody else? We are going to experience changes in the healthcare system in the United States in the near term future. Those changes may shift the emphasis and cause more or less damage. We don't know how that's going to go, but we do have some thoughts about it. And we're going to continue this conversation in our next HealthCast. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about doctor training. We've talked about the pay. We've talked about the management of the system and how chaotic it is and how physicians have to try to navigate that while at the same time taking care of their patients. But there are other ingredients, things like emergency room care and people that don't have insurance and don't have doctors and don't have money come to the emergency room to have a hangnail taken care of or to have a heart attack taken care of. And there's a federal law that requires hospital emergency rooms to take them all take all comers for all reasons, whether they can pay or not. Uh, we think that ought to be put in the mix for revising the regulations. And we have some suggestions for that and some other things. So hopefully you'll come back for that podcast as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin.
and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.